So welcome to this session. So our guest today is Igor Kapsin from Czech Academy of Sciences in Prague. And Igor uh, made his PhD in quantum gravity a long time ago in Western Ontario. Mm -hmm. But uh, then he shifted a bit to more fit your uh, and graphic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a quantum fit your and graphic. So thanks, uh, Wojciech, very much for the uh, invitation and uh, opportunity to uh, uh, talk about some uh, recent uh, recentish work. Um, so I uh, understand that maybe not everybody is familiar with you know everything that appears uh, in in the title. And I will do my best to kind of give some motivation and then explain um, uh, our results. Uh, kind of, uh, I, I might not go to all the technical details, but uh, there's some kind of technical core of, of our work, and I'll, I'll try to mention uh, something about that. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, let me <clears throat> just re remind. So. Uh, I mean, there's multiple aspects of, of what I'm going to talk about. So um, maybe the least familiar thing uh, to, to people might, might be this, what, what are Kilinyano uh, forms? Um, uh, and then maybe the second least familiar thing would be like, what does it mean to uh, have like an initial data uh, for some geometric uh, tensor on, on your space time? So I'll, I'll try to explain that. All right, so first reminder about this uh, Killing-Yano and conformal Killing-Yano uh, tensors. And at the same time, I uh, will introduce a little, uh, some basic ideas from uh, representation theory that, that play a role in, in our work. Uh, so the, you might you know, know that uh, there are Killing vectors. Killing vectors are uh, infinitesimal symmetries uh, of your uh, Riemannian Lorentzian uh, spacetime. Uh, um, and they, they satisfy uh, an equation. The equation is quite simple. Uh, you take a derivative of a vector, uh, you symmetrize that, and that has to be zero. Okay. So this uh, symmetrization is is a, is an operation that um, uh, that is uh, invariant under uh, basically orthogonal transformations of of, of your spacetime. So another thing that is invariant under uh, orthogonal transformations with respect to metric is sticking traces, right? So um, the, there are generalizations of killing equation to other uh, tensors. So symmetric tensors are sometimes called killing Stachel tensors. If you generalize to anti-symmetric tensors, these are called killing Yano tensors sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and so how do you get the equation uh, satisfied by these generalized killing tensors? Well, it turns out that you, uh, you know, you take your higher rank tensor, you take a derivative of it, and then you apply another kind of in, uh, or, or, or the orthogonal group invariant trans, uh, transformation to to the derivative, set it to zero. Right? And depending on what uh, which part you set to zero, then you get different kinds of uh, geometric tensors. So for the Yano uh, two forms, uh, you uh, uh, if if you ignore the conformal part, right? Uh, so you uh, uh, you you take um, a derivative, and then you uh, produce a uh, this this combination, right? So this combination permutes some some uh, indices, take some minus signs, and so on. Okay, so this is this is not the same y. This is just a name. That's just a name. <laughs> Yeah, so that's just the name of the operator that appears on the on on the right hand side. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what what is uh, happening here? So what's happening here is that, like I said, uh, when you you take a derivative of y, and uh, you do, you can decompose it into uh, pieces uh, 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 first without taking any traces. So so without taking any traces. That is, uh, you're only using operations invariant under general linear transformations. They don't have to be invariant under uh, under uh, things that, that uh, just preserve the metric. Um, so in that case, you, you use a little bit of representation theory. Um, 
And uh, you find that there are two ways to, to decompose it, okay? And the way that you uh, get this from representation theory, right, you, uh, you have to uh, uh, recall something about representations of general linear group, okay? So representations of general linear groups are uh, tensors with certain symmetries, okay? And they're labeled by Young diagrams. So Young diagrams are these, you know, uh, diagrams of number of boxes of non-increasing size, non-increasing non length. And the way that they're associated to tensors is you take any diag such diagram and uh, you, you, you fill uh, the boxes with tensor indices. Okay, and according to the pattern which you fill in, if you first symmetrize along the indices in each row, and then anti-symmetrize uh, uh, according to, uh, to this in, uh, indices in each column, right? Uh, you end up with something that is guaranteed to be an uh, irreducible representation of the general linear group, and uh, these are the only uh, finite-dimensional irre irreducible uh, representations. Right? Uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, the, uh, the when you uh, have some tensor which has a particular symmetry and you uh, take a derivative of, of it, uh, it, the the representation theoretic decomposition of that uh, object is the uh, uh, same as the uh, decomposition of a corresponding tensor product where you uh, associate uh, just uh, the usual vector representation to to the derivative part uh, into irreducible pieces. So. Uh, if you study a little bit or look up some, you know, references on uh, representation theory of the general linear group in n dimensions, you find that if you take a representation corresponding to two forms multiplied by a vector representation, it decomposes into two pieces. So one piece is completely anti-symmetric tensor with three indices, and then whatever is left over. So whatever is left over ends up being denoted by this hook Young diagram. All right, and this is exactly what is happening here. If uh, you do this decomposition, you call the uh, fully anti-symmetric piece the exterior derivative up to a constant, and whatever is left over, so this uh, symmetry is tensor with a young type of this uh, this hook, uh, uh, that is the Yano, uh, killing Yano operator. All right, so that's just the definition. Okay, now uh, if you uh, reduce your group, now you say, okay, I want things that are invariant uh, uh, that don't have to be invariant under all general linear transformations, but uh, only under those that preserve my metric. So you get get gain one invariant operation that you didn't have before, uh, on top of index permutations and symmetrizations. You get taking traces and then maybe you know multiplying by the metric to increase the number of indices. Uh, so uh, in that case, the uh, the tensor product uh, uh, and the, the the definition of what is an irreducible representation changes slightly, right? So now, on top of doing the symmetrizations along the Young uh, diagram, you have to subtract all the possible traces. So once you have subtracted all the possible traces, then whatever is left over is irreducible. So if you follow these rules uh, and uh, you decompose this uh, tensor product. Then you end up with one extra piece, which corresponds to the, basically the, the trace uh, of uh, of uh, where you, you contract uh, the derivative index with one of the uh, form indices, and uh, <clears throat> uh, that operator ends up being called the uh, divergence, right? And uh, uh, so, if if you uh, in ensure that uh, this remaining piece is traceless, then you know, the full definition, if you read out, it looks like this, and that is called the uh, conformal killing Yano operator, All right? So that's the definition. And, you know, you might be wondering why this definition is, is important. So you want, maybe, uh, well, you know that killing vectors correspond to infinitesimal symmetries. Uh, maybe you know that uh, symmetric killing tensors, so the killing Steiker ones, uh, correspond to uh, essentially conserved quantities of geodesic motion. So you take your uh, um, uh, your symmetric tensor, and then you contract, say, of k indices. You contract with k copies of the derivative of the geodesic curve, and that is a conserved quantity along the geodesic flow. All right. Uh, for anti-symmetric tensors, you can't do that because any such contraction will be zero. But it turns out that there is uh, an extension to um, uh, to geodesic flow, where you add some uh, uh, odd variables uh, sitting on top of the geodesics uh, that uh, you know one can define, 
And it uh, turns out that you know these odd variables you can contract with a fully anti-symmetric tensor. And that will give you a conserved quantity of this uh, super symmetric extension of the geodesic of geodesic motion. And then that you know also has some applications in I don't know string theory and things like that, supersymmetry. Um, there's uh, also uh, just a technical note. Uh, when you uh, define the conformal Killian operators and Killian operators for uh, arbitrary P forms, uh, there's a nice duality. Uh, when you take the Hodge dual of uh, something that satisfies the uh, killing Yano equation, then you get, uh, say, in n dimensions, uh, you have a p form, then you get uh, n minus p form, and that n minus p form will satisfy the conformal killing Yano uh, equation and the closed condition. So this, and vice versa, right? So if you start with a kind of high rank, uh, uh, con uh, uh, Yano killing you transform to something lower rank, then you get you get this duality. Uh, uh, conformal killing Yano. So the difference. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so this is this is killing Yano, and this is. And this is conformal, right? So you just subtracted the traces. So you make sure that this is this whole thing is traceless. Yeah. So one Okay. So all right. Uh, uh, with the, maybe for me, the most important um, uh, reason to, to look at these uh, forms, uh, sorry, these, these uh, Killiano forms, is that uh, there's a very interesting family of exact solutions in higher dimensions, Kernot ADS, called Kernot ADS spacetimes, which essentially describe higher dimensional black holes, uh, which also, uh, you know, also can be um, defined in four dimensions. And in four dimensions, uh, the uh, Kerr, uh, Kernot ADS uh, space times are a special case of this, right? So of course the Kerr black hole is a famously a special case of this, and uh, these space times are characterized locally by the existence of a uh, well. In, in this case, it has to be non-degenerate, uh, non-degenerate two form, uh, which satisfies these uh, closed. So when so it's closed under the exterior derivative operator and uh, satisfying the conformal Killian equation. So if you have uh, such such a geometric uh, object and you have a vacuum spacetime, you're automatically in this class. And this is a very interesting class. So maybe you know studying something uh, you know about these these equations tell, can tell you something about these spacetimes or vice versa. Right? All right. So Kerr always has been symmetric. Yes, yeah. Yes, so this the symmetric Killing tensor, in fact, is a derived quantity for, from this anti-symmetric one. And the same is true for in higher dimensions. Yeah. But only in four dimensions. In higher dimensions, you don't have that interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. So now, uh, what are the one? Uh, what is an example of something that that the, this equation can tell us about this Kernot ADS space times? Um, or well, he, here's a, a particular observation which uh, goes back to you know, at least the seventies. Uh, so you know, people were studying initial value problem for Einstein equations, right? And initial value problem tells you that you know you have uh, you. Three dimensional or you know, n minus one dimensional initial data surface, and you have initial data on it. If you if you extend the initial data by solving Einstein equations, it uniquely defines your space time up to diffeomorphism. Okay. Now uh, your the space time that evolves from this data might have for symmetries on it, so it might have killing vectors. All right. But if it's determined by initial data, so the information about the presence of killing vectors is kind of already encoded in the initial data. 
a question, how can you extract that information? Well, turns out that there is a, uh, a kind of uh, an equation intrinsic to the uh, initial data surface that, uh, of course, depends on the initial data, uh, which, uh, you know, if it has a solution, then that solution will necessarily, in a specific way, evolve into a killing vector on the spacetime. So uh, this equation became known as the killing initial data equation. And if it's, so its solutions are in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, killing vectors on the bulk spacetime. Yeah, so it's a very interesting uh, idea because, so there, there are several people, I, I think, um, so the, I think the Berezdivin, Cole, and Moncrief were some of the first people to observe this. So I don't know, maybe I'm missing somebody, but these are the names that uh, I, I'm aware of. Um, okay, so uh, and this this uh, this equation, killing initial data, it uh, of course you know gained some prominence uh, not not immediately in the seventies. I think in the nineties. Uh, people like uh, Khrushchev and uh, uh, so, uh, one of his colleagues from Vienna, I forgot the name momentarily. Um, sorry? Right. Yes, yeah. They, they kind of attracted attention to this and it, you know, gained some applications in the study of initial value problems and, uh, and so on. So uh, it's quite possible that uh, you could have uh, similar observations holding for other uh, interesting geometric tensors, not just killing vectors, right? So maybe killing symmetric killing tensors, anti-symmetric ones. So we decided to ask this question. Sorry. Ah. We decided to ask this question for kind of the next uh, simplest thing, uh, like conformal killing vectors and of these closed conformal killing yellow two foods. So this is what I'll describe in this talk. Okay, so the method of proof, or how do you prove that there's like this initial data system that can evolve into a geometric tensor along together with the evolution uh, with respect to Einstein equations? Okay. So um, we can just assume that the Einstein background is given. Okay, and uh, here's one way to approach this uh, this this idea. Um, you want a certain you know, a certain equation to be satisfied uh, at the initial data surface, but also in the in bulk space time. So suppose that these things that you want to vanish satisfy a hyperbolic equation themselves, all right? And if they have initial data equal to zero, then they are automatically zero in the bulk, right? So this is, I, I'll, I'll give you kind of the main technical lemma in, a, in, in steps that shows you how this idea is used to um, you know, uh, to, to convert this observation to an, this initial data system construction. All right, so the, uh, we have our background space-time. So let's imagine that we have some uh, hyperbolic equation P. So I'm not specifying what kind of hyperbolic. I just wanted to have a well-posed initial value problem in this, that sense that there's a certain order of initial data you can specify and that uniquely uh, um, determines a solution in, in the bulk. Right? Uh, so, you know, if, you, you know, it uh, acts on some variable psi and that psi is uh, zero and some initial data to sufficient order, then that psi is zero everywhere in space time. Okay. So uh, this P, P is a hyperbolic operator is one of the ingredients that we want. Okay. So now the psi that we want to vanish is the value of the, our equation, like killing equation, conformal killing equation, Close conformal Kiliano acting on some tensor, right? So this is the thing that we want our hyperbolic equation to propagate. Okay, so if this thing is zero to sufficient order at the initial data surface, then it's zero everywhere in space time. All right, but uh -huh. okay, but uh, what is it that we'll be applying our equation to, right? If we start with something that we only know at the initial data surface, right? We want to know whether that something will satisfy an equation later on. How do we know that that something, which phi, what values it takes 
outside of the initial data service. So that tensor phi has to be propagated as well. All right, so the propagation equation for, for that we call Q. Okay. Uh, and that Q, all right, it can't be arbitrary. It has to be related to the uh, equation that we started with. So we require that this Q uh, is uh, obtained by applying some other differential operator to the original equation E. So if Q is equal to zero everywhere, so, it, so phi is propagated along uh, with respect to this equation, uh, then this part vanishes. So sigma is another linear operator. And then uh, the values of the equation applied to phi is itself propagated by a hyperbolic operator. Uh, so if uh, the, uh, so E evaluated uh, uh, at phi at, at the initial values uh, surface, the sufficient uh, number of time derivatives vanishes, then E of phi will vanish everywhere in space time. So the key to proving that a certain uh, equation will be satisfied everywhere in the space time is to find these uh, such an identity that we call a, or a pair of identities we call a propagation identities uh, and uh, these are parameterized by the, uh, you know this this uh, differential operators so p and q have to be uh, hyperbolic in a certain sense and a rho and sigma appear here and they're somehow auxiliary to the to the whole procedure so once you know such such a propagation identity exists then you take these uh, uh, the the values of your equation and it's uh, there it's time derivative uh, at uh, the initial value surface you collect it together and that together gives you an e initial data system if e is a killing equation this is the killing initial data if it's conformal killing this is conformal killing initial data and so on so the question is just to find such an identity and then you know uh, identify exactly what the initial data are simplify as much as possible that's that's the goal oh, the yes so so, yes. Well, yeah. Use... Yes. All linear. Yeah. Yeah. Only. Uh, so, I, just to get it set up right, so you are assuming that you have a question back in space. Uh, yes. And then, what, what's the new structure on the Cauchy surface? Is there some. So the uh, the induced structure, it's the initial data for Einstein system, is, is, is the, the three dimensional metric and the extrinsic curvature. So that, that is sufficient to determine the evolution class. The three dimensional that is induced from the ambient. Yes. Yeah. And the extrinsic curvature. Yeah. yeah. Oh. By vacuum, you uh, mean a rigid class or uh, do you allow cosmological constants? So, so we allow cosmological constants. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it depends. So, so historically, people I, you know, did it or did not. So we, we, we do in our case. Uh, so another question. And sigma and rho are, are uh, differential operators. Yeah. Okay. So this is maybe a. So it sounds like it's an overcomplicated setup. Yeah. This one. Yeah. Well, um, you know. So if you momentarily forget that you know about the second equation, just think about this one. Okay, so it says that if Q of phi is equal to zero satisfied, the right hand side is zero, right? And Q propagates phi away from the initial data surface. So that's our like our geometric tensor. But it, uh, you want the propagation by Q to be so compatible with the equation that you want to solve, right? Because I could propagate by saying like, okay, well, it's just going to be zero everywhere. And that's not a very good way to propagate. So Q has to be related. Well, it's it's not in, invertible. It's not an inverse. So, I mean, if it's it was an inverse, it would be something like identity here. But Q is not identity. Q is a hyperbolic operator. So, it's some high order. If you insert one of another. With sigma composed with rho has something to do with e. It, well, it does by <laughs> by this relation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I, I, this maybe look like looks like an abstract setup, but uh, uh, all right. So I I will very quickly illustrate it with uh, an example uh, and then uh, move on to to our results. But first. I want to thank uh, Wojciech for pointing something out to me. 
because uh, I so I, I said in so in the previous lemma we needed these P and Q operators to be hyperbolic. So hyperbolic, I didn't define it exactly. I said it must have a, a well-posed initial value problem. And in our paper, we kind of made a, um, a slight a slightly incorrect assumption that uh, all uh, operators uh, on uh, our Lorentzian spacetime that uh, maybe have higher order, uh, whose principal symbol looks like a power of the wave operator, uh, are well posed have a well posed initial value problem and what you point out that this is not true for all of them uh, you need to satisfy maybe some other extra conditions um, uh, so let me, uh, right so it, it is not true that uh, all operators of this form are have necessarily a well posed initial value problem so one needs to check some conditions on subleading terms. So I don't understand these conditions very well, but uh, apparently they have a name, something like Levy conditions. Uh, but uh, an easier way to inter interpret this is that if you have a high order system, which is obtained by kind of collapsing a, uh, a second order uh, system that is, has triangular form, then it is okay. Because uh, the theory of, of well posedness for such systems is is fine and sometimes you can kind of like you know solve for one variable here plug it into the next one and you get like a high order equation this way which is equivalent to to the system so uh, but not all uh, 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 uh all high order equations with the uh, power of the wave operator principle symbols and necessarily come from from this part so in our work we didn't check that all of the high order uh equations of this type necessarily come from reductions sometimes it happened but not not always so this is a gap that what you point out to me so i just wanted to to bring that up up front uh and uh i i want to give you an example of how how this works where it's not a problem so uh, maybe you're familiar that you know if, if you work with uh, maxwell equations um there you know if you fix a gauge there are different versions of gauge fixing you can do right so you can uh, the popular choice of gauge is uh, Lorentz gauge where you know you take a divergence of your uh, vector field uh, and set it to zero and then you convert your original Maxwell equations to hyperbolic equations by adding something which is proportional to the gauge fixing condition proportional to delta of the of the vec uh, of the vector field um, but then you have a choice of which with what coefficient right so you can you when you add the right uh, uh, so, so you start with Maxwell equations and you add uh, d delta to it, you can uh, cancel one of the terms and you just end up with a wave operator. But if you pick a different constant, then in general, you have a combination of a wave operator and, and, and this d delta term. But it turns out that uh, uh, for generic choices of these coefficients, the equation is still hyperbolic. And how do you know that it's hyperbolic? is because you can find a complementary operator that you can apply to this guy such that uh, the uh, fourth order operator that you get by composition is just this, um, <clears throat> has this uh, uh, square of the wave operator as the leading term. And the way you prove that this has this hyperbolic, that it has like a green function, is you get the green function for this guy and then multiply by this complementary operator. So it's just kind of technicality. What is y? Is y here is a one form. Ah. So for like Maxwell. Potential. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So it's kind of uh, technical aspects. Sorry. So I finally get to showing you some examples. All right. So this is the uh, classical example of uh, the Killing equation. I think everybody recognizes this. Uh, now, maybe some of you know that if you take a divergence, you know, maybe uh, some, applying some trace reversal to, uh, to the killing operator, you get the wave equation acting on the vector field V. So this, this is the analog of our, this Q operator that we're talking about. So if you have a candidate initial data for a candidate vector field, killing vector field on your initial data surface, you can propagate it in a space time using box of V equals zero, okay? Uh, but at the same time, there's this identity where uh, you know it's it's true for all v. So it's just really an operator identity that if you 
plug the killing operator inside this, what you, you see is a hyperbolic equation, then the right-hand side factors through the, uh, the wave operator on V, right? So if V is propagated using box, this it vanishes, and we see that uh, uh, this is a hyperbolic equation that propagates the values of the killing operator applied to V. So if that is zero at the initial data surface, then that propagates to zero everywhere. And uh, what you now can do is you can say, okay, well, uh, this is a second order equation. I take my killing operator, I take its uh, first time derivative at initial value surface, and I just uh, take those equations and those will be my killing initial data. Now, the, those will be somewhat you know, um, complicated equations, uh, but you just throw away all the pieces that are not completely intrinsic to the surface, uh, to the initial value surface itself. And once you do that, you end up with this kind of nice set of equations, which are now known as killing initial data equations. So that's that's the basic idea. So, so the Einstein equation um, is is used. Sorry. So the Einstein equation is, is responsible for the simplicity of this equation. If Einstein equation didn't hold, you would have extra terms proportional to Ricci tensor. And uh, those terms, maybe they would not factor through this box V. So they would uh, obstruct this propagation identity. So we are always, at least in this work, on Einstein. So, uh, you know, any terms that will be proportional. Uh, here, we, we are uh, allowing cosmological constant, and it doesn't do any harm, no. OK. So, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So the capital A is is the tangent to the initial data. Yeah. So these are intrinsic. So the, there are other components of those. Um, yeah. So you you take these guys. It has other components, uh, like. Uh, uh, right, so so on top of these these guys, you have these other components you need to deal with, but they contain, uh, say, a, a formal time derivative of, of V, and it just tells you, ah, algebraically, the value of formal time derivative of V is equal to this uh, as a function of you know, uh, purely spatial differential operators. So these don't have to be included in these equations. So these equations really restrict V. The other equations, they tell you how to build the initial data for V so that you can propagate it. Into the future. Okay, does that make sense? So maybe I have to accelerate just a little bit because I want to show you uh, the uh, uh, basically the, the required identities which we found for conformal killing equation. So the conformal killing equation is just the killing equation minus the trace. This so this operator is traceless, uh, and uh, this is the <clears throat> Uh, the, the propagation identity. So you have uh, something which is not exactly a wave operator acting on V, which we obtain by taking a divergence of, of CK. But, so this, this equation Q is hyperbolic by this test that uh, uh, I, uh, I explained to you before. So I, I can find some second order complementary operator so that you compose it with Q, you get uh, Laplace, uh, so wave operator squared, and it does satisfy this uh, criteria that it can be reduced from uh, a, a triangular system because I can introduce, I can reduce the, the order by saying box of V is equal to W. And then I have equations which is, you know, box of uh, V minus W equals zero and box of W equals zero. So that's a triangular system. So it's fine. So it's really, really hyperbolic. And uh, then you have uh, propagation identity on the, uh, uh, a conformal killing operator itself, right? So you can see, so if you do the computation, computation of the left-hand side, you, can, you will find that it factors through this uh, Q of V, okay? So that uh, satisfies the structure that, that we want, right? So if Q of V is zero, this is zero, and this equation propagates the, uh, the values of the CK operator from zero to zero in the space time, okay? Now, 
this equation is uh, maybe also suspect to you because as I said, not every uh, operator that has uh, uh, that starts with uh, uh, power of box in a leading term is necessarily hyperbolic, has in a well posed initial value problem. But it turns out that the well, the way that we found this this uh, higher order propagation equation is that we we kind of broke it into pieces, uh, which turned and then you know put it back together, and the, the individual pieces were second order. So in fact, there's a, a way to extract um, an integrability condition from the conformal Killing equation. So you take the divergence of V, and it turns out that uh, that uh, you know is uh, you know is related to the you know some um, to to the the, the conformal Killing equation because the it 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 itself satisfies an interesting equation. It satisfies the equation that its second covariant derivative is zero, and this equation has interesting applications in conformal geometry. And so on, but it just so happens that uh, a divergence of a conformal Killing vector is itself a, a special geometric object on on the manifold. Okay, and this um, uh, equation, the second covariant derivative of scale equal to zero, has its own propagation identity, which is uh, which is second order. So the propagation identity for CK mixes with this. Uh, a, fi a fine second derivative operator, and a fine second derivative operator has its own propagation identity, and you compose them together, uh, you get the fourth order propagation identity I showed you before, and this is, satisfies this fixed number two I mentioned, and uh, to, to check that it that equation is is uh, well posed. Uh, I mean, this yeah. second this is not the it is, yes, yeah, yeah. No, no, I don't, I, I don't know what this has in manifolds, but this is just, yeah. So it's, it's just this equation, and if you think of it, okay, it's another kind of geometric equation. It has its own propagation identity. So that's, that's it. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's just like called AF. Yeah. Yeah. F, F for affine. Because I didn't have a better name for it. So in flat space, if you take two derivatives uh, and it vanishes, then it, you're dealing with an affine function. So I'd call it affine. <laughs> the coherent version of it. It's not symmetric. I, I have some, some... No, but for scalars, this is symmetric. Yeah. So for, for scalars, this is symmetric. Yeah. Okay. So uh, maybe one thing I, sh I should note is that uh, we, we found uh, these, these identities kind of like by ad hoc calculation. So we tried something. And then maybe it didn't work. We tried something else. Eventually, we found this. Um, and uh, uh, you can eventually, uh, you know, go through the same exercise. You know, I don't want to dwell on this, but you can again uh, take the values of this uh, the, of the conformal uh, Killing equation at time equals zero. Take sufficiently many derivatives, eliminate everything that's not intrinsic to the surface, and then you get the uh, conformal Killing initial data. Um, and incidentally, back in the 70s, uh, when there was like the, the Killing initial data was first introduced, uh, Beverly Berger tried to do this for conformal Killing, but she failed. She didn't find a, a sufficient set of conditions that will guarantee that something will evolve to conformal Killing. And the reason for that is that if you go read her paper, she tries to like take a first time derivative of the initial data, eliminate some things, try second, doesn't work, and so on. So. Because our propagation equation is fourth order, she needed to do this exercise four four times, and she only did it three times. So, <laughs> so unfortunately, yeah. So she, we we th thankfully succeeded where where she did not. Um, question? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's feeling of conformal initial data. 
Relativity constraint, which comes from the conformative equation. So, in some sense, more general. So, because you see, you decompose this, this whole vector into, into time dashes yeah. and bars and tangent bars. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, this is the data. Then, yeah. But in this case, you have to add some extra pieces. So, divergence, yes. Yes. Yeah. And divergence is ordinary. Four dimensional. Uh, well, the, yeah, so I mean, this, the, the, the divergence. Dimensional divergence, which is not. Ah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. So the four dimensional divergence. Uh, yeah. First, the derivative of, of, of P0. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so this means that the data in normal notation using not only P0 to the A, but also the time derivative. Absolutely, yes. And this yeah. time derivative is included Q. Yes, yes. And then you have also second derivative. Yes, yeah. So so in some sense, from this official data point of view, uh, as, a, as a conformal keeping equation, uh, it's, a, it's for something less natural yes if you have so it, i mean it is so less natural it be yeah like that, yes? yeah so it, it is so the the uh, the killing initial data only use the components uh of the potential killing vector on the initial data surface yeah. but here we have to use the formal time derivative as well yeah right but and it's kind of in some sense yeah, yeah. so so that is zero pa and then Time derivatives up to the second time derivatives of V0, yeah? Um, and VA also. Yeah? So we, we need but VA first time derivative of V0. Derivative. So we need the, uh, yeah. So second derivatives of V0 and yeah. first derivatives of V0, yeah? I don't understand the term now. Yeah, so we 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 kind of formally we, we need yeah first derivative of v zero which yeah. is included here and then we also need time derivative of that but uh, we have this q system which was second order and the second time derivative of of v can be eliminated using q so this this is already done using the this elimination with respect to q so you see like oh, okay. the this is formal right. So we use the symbol, but it really means that because we have already eliminated second time derivatives using Q of, of V. So, yeah. so you don't use the second. No. You, you have no more. Yes. Yeah. Data yes. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm finally getting to, uh, to the more complicated. The most complicated case of uh, the uh, closed conformal uh, killing Yana. Uh, so you you already maybe are convinced that all we need to make sure that this this method works is to find this propagation identity. And uh, in the previous cases, we were lucky that we played around with something. We found the identity. Right? We didn't need really need to ask where it came from. Right? But we tried to do this for conformal killing Yano, and we failed in different ways. So we tried just for killing Yano, just for conformal killing Yano. Somehow we needed to strengthen the system to close conformal killing Yano. So the more equations you have, kind of the easier it is to find the propagation identity. Um, and and uh, but even then, we we at some point needed to just to check like are we failing because we're not clever enough or because the propagation identity doesn't exist. So we decided to you know define some search space and then just do an exhaustive search. All right. So how do you define the search space? So all the equations that you saw are were geometric, right? So they are defined using only uh, covariant derivative, the metric traces, and and so on. Okay. So we want maybe uh, curvature coupling terms and so on. So we want to stay in that realm. We want the operators to be covariant in the in that sense. Uh, and uh, well, uh, we could you know look for these propagation operators for uh, to any order but then the larger the order the more possibilities there so let's try the simplest thing first let's restrict these guys to be at most order two okay so that puts restrictions on all the other operators 
here. And uh, uh, so, so, so here I presented all the operators as kind of these block uh, matrices. And I uh, just reminded you that uh, different blocks correspond to diff tensors of, in different uh, ON representations, okay? So the, the fields that we, that we are dealing with, the fundamental fields are two forms, okay? The killing Yano operator acts, conformal killing Yano acts on that, gives you this, this hook type tensor, and the exterior derivative gives you the, uh, the three form. And uh, the hyperbolic propagation equation that we want will, has to be uh, determined. So it maps this, this space into itself, right? So you need uh, invariant operators that map you know, these tensors to, to themselves, these tensors to three forms, three forms to these tensors, three forms to three forms. And the same thing everywhere else, okay? So uh, we, uh, I, I listed here kind of uh, in a schematic way, I, I just uh, told you how many independent operators satisfy our constraints, total differential order two, uh, which you know, kind of counts Riemann tensor as order two in a sense. So uh, uh, these, these are allowed in the mix. Um, <clears throat> uh, so we, we, uh, we kind of showed you how many independent operators uh, we find for every available slot. In this in this equation, right? So uh, this is first order. This is second order. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, second order. This is uh, yeah. Also, uh, no wait. So this first order. This is first order, mm -hmm. second order, and also second order. You're, you're the, the well, we, we're dealing with this total system. We're dealing with total system. So we have, actually have to treat them together. Yeah. Because it uh, can be obtained by a trace of the Riemann tensor. Yes. Um, so, but I, I just want to explain what we are doing here. So we, we're going to kind of take linear combinations of all these things with undetermined constant coefficients, okay? Parameterize everything. And whatever that, uh, you know, the composition of these things are going to be, this is going to be third order, okay? So we know that whatever operators we compose here, they'll end up in third order operators. So we need to kind of list all of them as well. And then for any pair of operators that we compose, we need to know which third order operator is going to correspond to. And we want to find you know, the p's, the sigmas, the q's, the rows, such that the right-hand side is totally zero. So you know, if we express the right-hand side in the basis of these third order operators, we want the coefficients of each one of them to be zero. So essentially, we're solving kind of a big linear algebra problem. So uh, there is there are six independent operators that satisfy our conditions, the order up to two, uh, invariant, and they transform these hook tensors into hook tensors. It's work. You have to do some you know representation theory to make sure that this is uh, this is what happens. So, so, so this is either one. I mean. So, so the commas means either or yeah yeah so otherwise I mean the expressions won't fit here so really it's a sum over you know one two through six with independent constant coefficients uh, so these are yes so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Up, yeah. up to second order because we we are including uh, zero order terms yeah. Right, so right, so this is kind of the table that tells you how we got it. So uh, you know, if uh, you can use the presentation to theory to figure out how many types of operators of different order that you can get uh, by saying, okay, well, um, if I apply box operator that has scalar representation, so it doesn't change the representation here. So there's only one way to uh, to get a um, uh, this hook tensor from from a hook tensor using box. But let's say I'm applying the uh, uh, symmetrized traceless derivative, second derivative. Well, now there's, uh, uh, there's uh, three different ways of doing this. So we give each one a label, right? 
So we've, we, we also consider contracting with uh, Riemann or Weyl tensor and also multiplying by a cosmological constant. And then we can do the same thing for third order operators. Okay. So you, you fill this big table and uh, it turns out that, you know, uh, this lower dimensions are kind of degenerate. And there's a general theory from representation theory, which is a generalization of um, Littlewood Richardson rule that tells you that th this list is complete, that there are no more. Uh, for uh, some special lower dimensions, you can check this with software, that there are no more than what is in this list, except there's some exceptions like four and six dimensions. But let's say we deal only in higher, sufficiently high dimensions. Okay, so we know we have a complete list. So this is not comprehensive. Yes, yeah. Uh, I mean, this you can do by hand. So yeah, and for arbitrary dimension, you have to do it by hand, but it's kind of more or less straightforward. Uh, okay, any moment now? Right. So, <clears throat> so we, we are you know looking at all the this different compositions. Uh, so the, these are all elements that appear in this propagation identity that we want to vanish. Okay. And we know that all these compositions will be third order operators. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I remind you where they come from, right? So these compositions, they will be expressed as third order operators. And we have parameterized the third order operators as well. Okay, and the parameterization looks like this. So it's, you know, just, you take any of these compositions, you express it in uh, third order operators, and then the coefficients are expressed in this big matrix. So it turns out that our I identities that we want, they correspond to left null vectors of this big ma numerical matrix. So we reduced all this representation theory, differential geometry to finding left null vectors of this numerical matrix with entries maybe depending on the dimension. Well, you just plug it into a computer and it tells you that there is a five parameter family of null, left null vectors. So there's a five parameter family of these propagation identities. Now we need to check whether the, these hyperbolicity cons constraints are satisfied. Now, so uh, the, what we, we checked is that um, the, the, the hyperbolicity is in the sense of that you can find a complementary operator that will compose with the operator we want to check and it will give you something which is power of wave operator plus low order terms. But we didn't go further and check that in all of these cases, you can actually show that it satisfies a levy or whatever, re re reducibility from a triangular system. So this is a, a, a gap that's, that's still there. But just keeping that in mind, there's a five parameter family. Uh, and among these five parameters, there are some special subfamilies which happen to be uh, linear, linear hyperplanes. The, which are excluded, where these, this hyperbolicity condition is, is not satisfied. But a generic family, element of this five-parameter family satisfies this hyperbolicity condition, okay? And we, because we use the representation theory, we know that this list is exhaustive in dimensions sufficiently uh, high. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah. Well, so the right. So the, these p's and q's, I mean, they have some dimensions in them, but they also have other terms, right? So they are, of course, low order terms, but the dimension and these contractions with second derivatives appear on equal footing. So it's you can't say that it's just version plus low order terms. But the, the whole thing, you know, you take this left null, uh, null vector, you figure out what operator corresponds to, you find the complementary operator, and you can compose them to get something which is boxed to some power plus low order terms. Okay, so that is basically the end. Um, so we, we, you know, went through this exercise for conformal killing, for this uh, closed conformal Kiliano in sufficiently high dimensions. Uh, yeah, we, we use this idea of propagation identity to be systematic about 
our approach. Uh, and we also use uh, this uh, representation theory of the, of the orthogonal group to be even more systematic when possible. Um, one curious thing that that uh, we, we notice is that okay, conformal killing operators are somehow invariant objects in conformal geometry, uh, uh, but Einstein equations are not conformally invariant. Right? So we found this propagation identity uh, for confor uh, conformal killing vectors module Einstein equations, and the, our propagation identity is not conformally invariant in any obvious way. Right? But maybe that's because the Einstein equations themselves are not conformally invariant. But maybe there's a way to reinterpret these identities in conformal geometry. And well, what if, if that's possible or how that could be done, we don't know. So maybe it's something to think about. Um, so of course, in the future, one can consider other geometric PDs from the same point of view. One should fix, you know, to make sure that uh, everything we claim to be uh, to have a well-posed initial valid problem really does, or kind of add extra exclu exclusionary conditions uh, for our propagation identities. Uh, and maybe another question to think about, so I at the moment don't have any ideas about this, uh, you know, uh, it, uh, is it possible maybe to, to tell in advance or with some work that this exercise will fail for some geometric PD? So is there some geometric PD for which you definitely cannot find a propagation identity on on Einstein spaces, so, I don't know. Uh, so it's another thing to possibly think about in the future. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Well, we don't have a propagation identity for it. Okay. My, my, so, so my, my, my is that yeah. Is so, 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 the uh, simple, no, conformal variant. Yeah. And one can do it uh, in terms of factors. Okay. So oh, sorry. Maybe I should, I can make a quick comment. So when we did this exhaustive search, uh, right? So we were looking for, so these, these, these identities. So this includes the possibility that there's a decoupled uh, propagation identity just for CYK and we didn't find it. So such a possibility is excluded by this, by, by our criteria. So we did a search and we found that it doesn't exist. Okay. At least of second order, second order. So, so, what... so I, I mean, we, so uh, if we did an exhaustive search uh, among the search, if there existed a second order propagation identity just for conformal Kiliniano without a close condition, we would have found it, but we didn't find it. A couple of setups at this stage. Well, it would basically would uh, have everything zero here, except uh, yeah. So it would it would basically decouple uh, these two operators. Yeah, it's not conformal. Yes, I agree. Depends on Okay, interesting. And this, and this is also related to the equation that being the metric. Uh-huh. So I think all fits together. So I, I, I know this more that you can play around with factors, with the fact of people corresponding to your conformal to the other people, and uh, the factor that corresponds to the other choice of time scale. And then you'll see that you'll throw the property uh, Hmm. So, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's an interesting idea to involve tractors, like if you want to do a really serious conformal geometry. Uh, but may, maybe a good place to start would be to go back to the conformal killing case, which is simpler. 
and then see how that can be incorporated there. So it's an interesting idea. Yeah. The um, so what what would be the the equation so the equation is that uh, you take the uh, one form which is the potential and then basically replace the the conformal Kiliano by the composition of, of this operator with the exterior derivative one forms maybe yeah I don't know if that will simplify anything but I, I mean it's in a, in a kind of equivalent maybe way of, of uh, thinking about it Right, so uh, if you say that, okay, your geometric field is not, is defined up to gauge, then of course, you know, then you would really allow non, strictly speaking, hyperbolic equations in a propagation identity that would admit the gauge fixing. Well, that makes it kind of more complicated. <laughs> it's true. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you see, after differentiation, you have three initial data. Yeah. So, so you can play also this, not the potential, but the current. And then we can tried to play this game with uh, killing Yano without the conformal or closed conditions, but we, we couldn't do it. So it's, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, well so yes yeah so you can so let me go back to yeah but ah. yeah okay so so these are Ah, these are the original killing. But well, but I mean, let's let's look at this anyway. So so they explicitly involve the you know this extrinsic curvature and the the Ricci say a Ricci scale a Ricci tensor of the metric on the surface. Um, uh, so you you could uh, maybe uh, I didn't quite follow, follow your your question, but what, one thing I can say is that um, you you can say okay, let us require that these equations have some solutions. So they might have uh, integrability conditions. So uh, you know these integrability conditions will, in a sense, impose conditions on the initial data themselves. So you could use these equations as a way to come up with initial data that will admit you know higher numbers of, of killing vectors or conformal killing. So they, you can play this game. So maybe I don't know if it's exactly the direction that you're you're asking. Well, I mean, um, for me, it's linear system, and it's actually yeah. the same story as you do with equations and quality, right? You can do prolongation. Yes, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, close it up. And, yeah, and look at the integrability conditions, yeah. The and vanishing curvature. Because, like, and, and this way, you don't say time, right? Yeah. Because you don't have time. 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 Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Ah, yeah, but the, for care, yeah, killing symmetry is uh, is not a strong enough condition, right? Yeah, but if you read, if you yeah, if you have this, uh, con yeah, this killing tensor, yeah, 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 it is strong enough. Yes, yeah, 
then, but that would be like a really complicated way to rederive Kerr because Kerr can be derived in some, some ways that are or much already much easier. Yeah. Yeah. They're quite complicated. Yeah. So especially the. So I think I didn't even display the initial data for the Killingano equations because it's just kind of complicated. Thank you very much. Yeah.